Hey Reckless, Happy New Year. It is so good to be back with you. I hope you had a great Christmas break and uh, welcome to 2021. After all that we've been through over the last year, it is good to uh, kind of turn the page into a new year. And so I know even as we go into this year, a lot of things have remained the same. I know that there's still a lot of craziness going on, a lot of uncertainty, but uh, excited about this upcoming year and what God has in store for us. So I'm excited that you are back with us. I'm excited that you are in your group tonight and, uh, and join us for this video and having a chance to be a part of the discussion. And so I'm excited about this upcoming year for a lot of reasons. Uh, number one, I'm excited about some of the series that we're gonna be diving into, what we're gonna be doing between now and the end of the school year, some of the things we're gonna talk about, and some of the growth that, that I believe God's gonna allow us to see together. Uh, just as we grow in our faith and our understanding of who he is. And so we've got a great semester plan. We've got some details about Rush that's gonna be coming up very soon. So you wanna make sure to stay tuned for that as we let you know what the plan is for that. And, um, and then as we mentioned at the, uh, the last week before Christmas, uh, we are looking to scale back into meeting weekly on the Westridge campus uh, every Wednesday night, hopefully after, fall or after winter break. And so we're gonna meet like this between now and uh, winter break. Uh, we'll have a January gathering on January 27th, but then the hope and the plan is that after winter break, we'll be able to gather together weekly for a service and for groups uh, like we did last year and be able to do that through the end of the year. So I'm excited about this year and uh, I hope you are too. I hope that as we begin this year that you'll just open yourself up to say, God, what is it that you wanna do in me and through me over the next year. And, uh, and let's just see what God has in store for us. And so we're gonna enter into, into a time of worship and, uh, and then I'll be back here in just a few minutes for a brand new series that we're kicking off for this week. Well, hey everyone, it's good to see y'all again. Um, good to be back with your small groups and I know you may find yourself in homes or scattered around the church again, um, but it's just good to be together with those that you know you're doing life with, those that you know you can count on um, there's just something about that that's just the way God designed us to live in community, live in biblical community. And even in the songs that we sing, I think it's really important to remember that we're pulling from the character of who God is, um, Scripture that talks about God's faithfulness. And the same way that we need to rely on those around us and the people in our group, we need to be reminded that God is faithful. He's always with us. And so as we have a time of worship in our groups today, I wanted us to be able to focus on just that truth, that God is always with you in every season. Ecclesiastes 3 talks about the fact that God works in seasons, and we may find ourselves in different times of life, but no matter where you're at, He's with you. He cares about what you're going through, and He's walking with you faithfully, just like we see in Daniel with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and that Jesus was in the fire with them, that Peter, when he walked on water, he saw Jesus, and he knew he was with him. And he had that faith to take those steps. So we just know he's with us. And so I just pray that you would be encouraged by this, that you would worship with it. Whether you know the song or not, if you know it, then let's just sing out in faith. If you don't, let the truth of these lyrics just wash over you and be reminded that God is faithful. He's with us and we were meant to do this together. So let's, let's worship with this today. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden For another died for me There is another in the fire dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave 
slave to my sin anymore Should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I will bow to the things of this world Oh, I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire stuff. Thank you, Jason. Well, we are, for this week's video, beginning a brand new series that we're going to be in between now and, f and winter break. And it's a six-week series that is called Anchored. And uh, I think this series in so many ways is appropriate uh, based on where we're at as a nation, as a culture, uh, just again, the season that we continue to find ourselves in right now. And there's so much chaos, there's so much going on, and so over the course of this series, what we're going to be talking about is how we can hold on to truth during this time that's so difficult and uncertain, how we can be anchored in such a way that while things may be crazy and chaotic all around us, um, we, can, we can hold steady and hold firm. And so you guys, your high school students, you know kind of what, a, what an anchor is. An anchor is a a device that is deployed from a, a ship or a boat that kind of holds holds that boat steady or firm to the bottom of the ocean or the bottom of a body of water, right? And so when everything on the surface, a storm may be raging, there may be a hurricane, there may be something crazy going on on the surface of the water and, and, or, and around it, that underneath in the bottom, that anchor holds it secure um, 
and, and holds it in place while everything may be, may be spiraling out of control on the surface of the water. And so, man, I think there is so much truth to what we're gonna be talking about in this series that's gonna help us, that defines kind of where, where we find ourselves in this season of life. And so it reminds me of a, a story I heard recently of uh, years ago, there was a, a hurricane that had, had been passing through the Bahamas in the, in the Caribbean. And so there were a group of single men who were living on this houseboat. It's kind of small, it wasn't, wasn't all that fancy or anything like that, but this was their home where they were staying. Um, and so this group of men, as this, this hurricane was approaching, they ferociously were trying to tie the boat uh, to all kinds of stuff. They were tying it to the dock, to nearby trees. They were just trying to, as many different things as they could possibly tie it to uh, on the surface of the water and, and there around it, just to, to keep it steady from the storm that was approaching. And so by the end of this thing, this boat looked like a spider web of, of ropes and cords that were tied to all these different things on the, on the surface to try to hold it steady. And so as the men were doing this, this uh, local man who was in, in that time was kind of a, a cult hero because of the number of hurricanes that he had survived and, and just his knowledge of, of how to anchor ships and things like that. And so he approached the, this group of men and he said, hey, let me give you some sound advice. He said, if you tie it to anything on the surface of the water, then you're asking for trouble. He said, your best hope, your only hope is to set your anchor deep under the water, set even multiple anchors deep under the water, and then pray for the best result. Now, I think when it comes to all of us, I think maybe we've heard stories of, of ships that, that uh, survived crazy storms and ships that were destroyed and even maybe people that were lost. And a lot of times it whether it succeeds or fails has to do with whether that anchor was properly secured. And what we're going to be doing is, is looking at a, a book of, of Colossians in the, in the New Testament. And this book that was written was written to a group of people to try to give them hope and encouragement to teach them how to properly anchor their lives in a way that would secure them through the craziness and the difficult times of life. Now, just to give you a little bit of backstory about this book as we kind of begin to dive into it, it was written by a couple of men. It was written by the Apostle Paul, who many of us have heard about, and it was also written by his apprentice, Timothy, who was a young pastor. And so these two guys are writing to this church, and they're writing to this church in a small town called Colossae. Um, it wasn't a well-known city, or at least not at this time. It was just kind of a more of a remote place that people had to specifically come to for a reason and, and for a purpose. And it was located in what is modern day Turkey. Ironically, this, this town, Colossi, was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 62, just a, few, a number of years after this book was written to this church. But this particular group of, of believers, they were faced with three specific things, three things that they were up against. Number one, they were they were facing false teachers who were trying to mislead them or lead them away from the truth. The second thing they were faced with was just doubting the supremacy of Christ. In other words, that Jesus is in control of everything, that Jesus is in charge of everything. And so they were faced with just people who were trying to, to delegitimize that or doubt or cause doubt uh, or disbelief about that. And then the third thing that they were faced was with putting their hope and trust in temporary things. Now, I know for, for you and I in, in 2021, like there's a lot of things that we're up against, right? There's a lot of things that we face from a pandemic and stuff in our country that's going on right now. There's just a lot that we're not sure what this year is gonna hold. There's a lot of difficulty that we're facing as a nation and, and as individuals right now. But when you think about the, the things that this church was facing, when it comes to our faith, like we're facing some of the same things today that they were facing. There is an assault on truth, right? Or at least in terms of believing that there is an absolute standard of truth that is for, all, for everyone. We are, there's a, a lot of people that want to doubt and disprove the supremacy that Jesus in, is in charge, right? There's a lot of people that want to take and say, hey, the things that Jesus taught, like some of the words that he said, like they were really good, they're good beliefs or whatever. Um, and so there's a lot of people that believe some of, the, some of the things that Jesus taught, 
But there's a lot of people that don't want to believe that Jesus is in charge of everything and that that's the best way to live is by making Jesus in charge of your life. And then, I mean, there's constantly, like as a, as a culture, we're faced with, with trying to put our, find our hope and build our lives on temporary things, whether it be relationships, whether it be money or possessions or other things, like to find our hope and our satisfaction in temporary things. And so when you, when you look at the things that, that this book is going to address, it's very similar to the things that we need hope from or hope for and things that we need instruction for. And so what we're going to do over the next six weeks is we're going to dive into this, into this book. And so one of the things I'm going to challenge you as individuals and even to, to kind of make this a part of your small group is to, to read the book of Colossians on your own. Right, as we're going to be talking through this over the next six weeks, um, that during the week you're just kind of picking apart and you're spending a few minutes every day, uh, or during that week just just reading that yourself, um, and just asking God to speak to you in uh, in a way that you need to hear it. And so let's go ahead and dive in, starting in verse six. So it says, "This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives." just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. I, I love that this is one of the ways in which the writers are starting this verse and they're saying, look, the, this good news is it's gonna change lives. Like when, when the good news of the gospel, when who Jesus is takes root in your life, it's gonna transform you. It's gonna change you. And he's saying, look, it is changing lives all over the place, just like it is changing your life. And my hope is that as you're reading this, that you're looking at your life and going, man, is, is Jesus changing my life? Because that's a key evidence that, that the gospel of Jesus is, is taking root in your life because you see a transformation in your life and the different aspects of it. So skip ahead to verse uh, 9 and 10. So it says, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Now stop there for just a minute. What Paul is asking and, T and Timothy is asking, he's saying, look, we're we asking God to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. He's saying, look, if, if you have the knowledge of God's will and you have understanding, not human understanding, not human wisdom, not common sense, but if you have spiritual wisdom and understanding that is given to you by the Holy Spirit, by God, it helps you enable, it helps you understand the will of God for your life. He says, then you will produce good fruit in your life. You will live in such a way that it will honor God. I, I love that basically he's there is an assumption that if we have God's wisdom and we know God's will, we will live it out. Right? It it, it makes an assumption that we are committed to doing whatever it is that God asks us to do, it really just means that we have to know what that looks like. But the commitment is there, right? It's not like, hey, look, I pray God gives you wisdom and knowledge, and then if he does, then you need to kind of weigh and evaluate and say, all right, am I committed to this, am I not? No, he's saying, look, if, if you have wisdom from God, if you have understanding of God's will for your life, you're gonna produce good fruit because the commitment is already there. You're already committed to living out your life in accordance to who God has called you to be. So the question is, are we? He makes the assumption that the, the, the church in, in, this, in this town of Colossae, the, the Colossian church is committed to that. But just like we talked about um, back in December before the holidays, have we kneel, knelt before God as the ruler, as the king of our lives? Have we committed? We may not understand everything. We may feel like we lack wisdom or knowledge, or I'm not sure how we're, I'm supposed to handle this situation. I'm, I wish I knew you know, what God wanted me to do in this situation. But we know that we're committed to it. 
once we figure it out, I'm going to live it out. And, and the question is, are we, have we fully committed our lives to Jesus to say, Jesus, I don't understand it all, but once I do, I'm committed to living it out. And he's saying that once, once God reveals that to you, you're going you're gonna to produce good fruit in your life. You're going to live out your life in such a way that honors and reflects who God's called you to be. We just need to know what God's will is. I think this may be for a lot of teenagers, for you, you guys especially, and, and even as you get into adult, uh, to, to be a, an adult, I think that's one of the questions, like what is God's will for my life? I just wanna know God's will, right? And I have had so many moments throughout my life, especially when I was younger, I'm like, God, I just need to know your, your, your wisdom. I need to know what your will is. I remember one time, and I've shared this story before, but when I was a 19-year-old, uh, 18 or 19, actually 18. No, I just turned 19. Uh, I was a 19-year-old freshman in, in college, and there was a, a season of my life where like, I had no idea what God wanted for my life. Right? I was in a band. We're leading worship. We're doing all these kind of things. And so I remember at, at one point there was this, this camp that we were going to lead worship for in Texas. And so I remember going back and forth, like, God, what do you want me to do? What do you not want me to do? And so, like, I knew that I just, I, I was committed to doing whatever God wanted me to do. I just needed to know what that looked like. I just needed to know God's will. Um, and so I remember one day just kind of praying, and, and Jesus said, like in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything will be, will be given to you. And so I remember just getting on my knees before God and saying, God, I am fully committed to doing whatever it is that you want me to do. And I remember God saying, like, I want you specifically to go to this camp in Texas. And so there was an issue with a, a job. I ended up having to quit my job, but I knew for certain that this was God's will and God's plan. And so I remember we, we ended up going to the camp in Texas uh, later that summer. We led worship. It was an amazing week. Um, I end up meeting my wife at that camp. And I look back and go, man, what if I had not been willing to be fully committed to God's will? Like, what if it was wishy-washy? And when, when God revealed what his will was to me as I was asking him to do it, God showed it to me. And then it was a matter of my commitment. Is my commitment there? Am I willing to do whatever it is that God's called me to do? And I think for you, it's it's understanding God's will, but it's also first and foremost making sure that you're fully committed to doing the will of God whenever it is that he reveals it to you. And so that's a, a question I think all of us have to, to, to answer. Am I committed to living out the will of God? And, and Paul is saying, if you are, I'm asking God to give you wisdom, to give you spiritual understanding, to give you knowledge of his will. And when he does that, your life is going to produce fruit because that commitment is there. Now, you may ask yourself the question, why, why should I commit my life to Jesus? Why should that commitment be there? Why is that such a big deal? Well, the Apostle Paul and, and Timothy give us the answer in verse 13 and 14, and here's how we'll kind of close for this week. He says, because of what he's done for us. Verse 13, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Now again, he's talking to believers. He's saying, why should we commit our lives to him? Because of what he's done for us. He has made us no longer an enemy of his, but he has taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and brought us into his own kingdom. He's made us right with himself. He's forgiven our sins. He's freed us from the, the curse of our sin nature, from who we used to be, from living in darkness, he's now brought us into light, into his kingdom. We have now been made a son or a daughter of the king of kings. And he's purchased our freedom and forgiven our sin. So when it comes to the question of why should we commit our lives to Jesus, it's because of what he's done for us. Because of the sacrifice that he made, because of the extent that Jesus was willing to do to the cost that he was willing to, to pay so that you and I could be forgiven, so that we could be made right with him. So if you and I have put our faith and trust in Jesus as Savior, 
we belong to him. He has brought us out of the kingdom of darkness and, and brought us into his own kingdom. We have now been set free. We are no longer who we used to be. We are, we are not someone we've never been before. We are sons and daughters of the king. We are no longer enemies of God. We have now been brought into the family of God. Jesus made that possible through his death and resurrection. And so because he was willing to go, pay that cost and go to that, that, to, to go to that extent to make us free and make us his, then we should be fully committed to living our life out. And that's how the Apostle Paul and, and Timothy finished this, this chapter or finished this particular section. And so for us, holding on to truth in difficult times starts with knowing what God has done for us and what he gives to us. If we want to be anchored and hold on to the truth in this season that we're in, we have to have a clear understanding of what God has done for us, of setting us free from our sins, of making us his own sons and daughters, and also what he gives to us. He gives us the knowledge of his will. He gives us spiritual understanding and wisdom. When we're not sure what we're supposed to do, we, we turn to God and God gives us the wisdom. It also says that he gives us the power and the peace that we need to anchor us, to hold us in this season so that we can stand firm, so that we can trust him and know that he's in control. And so as we move into this year of uncertainty, as we move into this year that, that may potentially hold difficult moments and difficult circumstances, knowing what God has done for us and knowing what God gives to us can anchor us and hold us secure and give us the hope that we need in spite of what we may face. God, I pray that you would help these students and leaders who are watching this, God, to continue to be anchored into the truth of who you are, of what you've done for us, what you give to us. And God, who we belong to, we belong to you if we've put our faith and trust in Jesus as Savior. And so God, I pray for students that are watching this that maybe have not taken that step. They have not put their faith and trust in you. They have not allowed you to forgive them from their sins and to make them right with you. God, I pray that they would take that step. They would call on your name and trust you as their Savior and that you would forgive them and set them free. God, would you anchor us as we move into this year? Would you help us over the next six weeks, God, to, to learn truth and pick up understanding of things that ways that we can anchor our life to you so that we can live out these crazy difficult uh, times and days that we're in. We trust you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to turn you loose to your groups for some great discussions. You continue to dive in some of the things that we didn't have time to get to in this video. So I pray you have a great conversation in your group, and we'll see you guys again next week.